Breaking news. Protestants just learned that church history did not begin in the year of 1517. Now they're struggling to figure out what's next. You're listening to Cornfield Theology. Well, what's next? What's going on, Brooks? How you doing? I think the next thing in church history is that the prodigal son has returned to Redemption Hill Church. <laughs> You're the prodigal, aren't you? <laughs> well, everyone, thanks for tuning in to this Cornfield Theology uh, podcast. And if you're watching on, on YouTube, you are indeed watching us via Zoom. And uh, if you don't know, Brooks, Brooks Sevchuk, he's got more consonants than vowels in his last name. No, he's got more vowels and consonants in his last name. How does that go? No, it's all consonants. I it's don't all, have any vowels. Oh, you have a Y that name. acts as a vowel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, so, I have an E, actually. Never oh, mind. Don't, I don't know how to spell my last name. I don't know your last name. Well, you know, this is good that you're, you're, uh, we're doing this podcast together, Brooks, because as um, some of you may know, others of you will not know, Brooks is the one who helped kick off our Cornfield Theology podcast probably, what, a year and a half ago now? Helped kick off means it's my podcast that was stolen <laughs> from me. I, I took it from your hands. You were gripping so hard. I'm like, no, it's mine. I loved it though. Such it was a, such a fun time to record. I'm really yeah. excited to be back on to to talk, man. Because I, this is just it's it's edifying to me to be able to yeah. talk through some of these things, and yeah. I, it's really fun. I really love this. And we got into a lot of issues uh, before you uh, left me, left the Des Moines Metro and um, your church that loves you. And uh, we we got into a lot of stuff, man. We got into everything from Calvinism to what does it mean to go to seminary, and then. Uh, Women deacons. Some women deacons. Contra- some controversial stuff. We didn't get into too much stuff. politics. We should have that. Done was our that. thing, man. The controversial yeah. stuff. Oh, oh well, that, I mean, you know, Logan's taking your spot to some degree, and we did the really controversial stuff on why we're not woke. And we, yeah, thought, I, I listened. To that I thought we we're gonna get canceled, but we didn't. Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. Wait, someone will find get get a hold of it. Usually what happens is someone who doesn't listen to the podcast yeah. finds one episode they don't like and then they blast you on Twitter and then you're canceled. Oh, yeah. So that, that's kind of the process. So you're just uh, you're just waiting on on someone to find it, right? Some of the- Yeah. You know what I've realized about social media? I don't care about social media. <laughs> you see you say that, but to me like you do cuz well, you're on it. I am. And you post things. I do post things. But what I am not is I'm not a part of the keyboard warrior society. Um, it's oh, an official society gotcha. that I've created where people love to pontificate and give their um, totally irrelevant and irrational opinions. So um, you've uh, created a society, an official yeah. society, but you're yeah. not a part of it. No, I'm not a part of it because I just post memes and just, you know, little, uh, I, I, oh, the, the, what I do with social media is like one church stuff to just try to be uh, like witty, you know? And occasionally I'll put something provocative like uh, eggnog is horrible and you should never drink it. And that gets, I saw that. I, I really, I, I feel like you and I, when it comes to Christmas are really, really on the same page, like love Christmas, love the whole season. Christmas music all year round. All year round. Like, yeah, I'm celebrating the incarnation. What am I, am I supposed to stop? Anyway. You know what? Next time someone hates on you. Next time someone hates on you for listening to Christmas music in June, that's when you say, dude, it's incarnation music. Get over it. I do say that, but they don't accept it. Well, sometimes I doubt their Christianity. You know what I mean? (laughs) Jeez. Well, speaking of Christianity, and uh, at times when Christianity was doubted, uh, we're going to talk about early church history, man. And uh, we had had hoped to have this podcast in person um, last weekend. But things happened, COVID happens, and uh, now we're doing it via Zoom. So uh, can you explain a little bit why uh, this particular topic, Brooks? You, uh, you're you going through some things right now, class. Um, I have a particular yeah. love for this, but go ahead and explain from your perspective why you're looking forward to this particular conversation of just a, kind of an overview of the early church. Okay, so there are some pieces of information that I think a lot of evangelicals assume about church history um, that are not very accurate. And it was so interesting to me. I'm in uh, history of Christianity too at, at Midwestern Seminary. Yep. I've really loved reading through a few books on church history 
um, recently and thinking through these things, one thing I realized was I think everyone assumes that like the further back you go in history, um, the more accurate beliefs you get. So right. it's like, however, if you're, however close you are to the apostles in the early church, that's, that's however accurate you are. But yep. um, we see looking into church history that they were very similar to us, even as soon as like 50 to 70 AD with different groups, believing different things, theological disagreements and uh, orthopraxy disagreements. Um, even the early church fathers on just completely really wide right. spectrums. So one thing I think that we learned from church history is not necessarily um, what to believe precisely. You can't, like you can't just look at it and be like, oh, this is the thing to believe because you know there are people in church history that believe this. But what we can get is um, some of the history of our religion, I think, which is really important. Some of the theological developments um, yeah. that have influenced later theology. So for example, just thinking through this, Calvinism, um, something really popular, a lot of people love to talk about, but Calvinism is built upon the foundation of theological arguments that happened um, at the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, 325. Um, and 325, it was Council of Nicaea. Connected with... Yeah, you know who Calvin's so, favorite theologian was? Augustine. You know, he's like eating... Everyone's up, favorite you know. theologian. He's the guy, you know? Yeah, I know. But you see the connection, though, too. And that's the one thing with the Reformation. You talk about Calvin, Luther, Melanchthon, and the whole lot there. Uh, Beza. Um, they are going back to the early church they're going back to what we call like classical greek you know and um even more classical latin um, um literature like they're going back to the classics and that was that was that was the huge thing that came out of the renaissance and into the reformation it was a rediscovery of you know greek texts you know everything was latin then but now we got like a greek manuscript <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a massive shift in some of the theology from right. the catholic church as we kind of lean more into the protestant church Speaking of the Catholic Church, Sean, wasn't church history all works-based Catholicism? Wasn't it until 15, 16, and 17? So when when Jesus gives the keys to Peter, does that isn't that like now we're a Catholic, right? That's the first pope. <laughs> eh. right. Why would, we we only go back to the to the 16th century for our for our history? Yeah, you know, I mean part of my story in terms of like my discovery uh, and love for church history is that I grew up Catholic, right? And then um, I grew up Catholic and kind of, just, you know, the workspace salvation and believing that, you know, if you do enough good things at the end, you know, that'll outweigh, you know, your bad deeds and you'll maybe go to purgatory and enough people, enough people pray for you, you go to heaven. Okay, great. Well, I got saved in my early twenties, but I still have this, I have this passion to um, kind of go back even further than, you know, 15, 17, 15, 17, the reference to that, if you don't know, is um, the year Martin Luther put the 95 thesis on the Wittenberg chapel door in Wittenberg, Germany. And that kind of sparked what people now call the reformation. Well, there's a lot that took place um, leading up to, to that, right? Like before that you have John Wycliffe before that you have Jan Hus uh, guys who were reading their Bible and, and saying, you know, this is not mapping on with what we see in the church today. And I'm, I'm going to be governed and guided by the word of God and not by the Pope as an authority over a particular issue right and so those yeah. are, those those men die they're martyred the the other assumption i think is that um the catholic church has been consistently what it is now throughout history but in reality you see major shifts happen around 700 a.d around 1000 a.d uh, and then again around like 1400 to 1700 um they haven't always been the same it's, right. it's from my understanding of history what one thing that i've noticed is um, the Catholic Church became really affiliated with governments. So you see like right. most governments throughout history have had some kind of either state mandated or state supported religion. Catholicism became the religion of Rome and of the Byzantine Empire. And um, I think I don't want to blame, you know, just a handful of people, but people like Charlemagne, <laughs> people, people like Constantine yeah. um, who made government mandated religion. I don't want to say they weren't they weren't genuine in trying to do something good, but what they right. did was give the church power that over time the church refused to lose and was willing to change their theology, change their practice, oh, yeah. change everything in order to keep the power. Power corrupts, man. I mean, you say what you want about the United States and the constitution, but there's something really significant about separation of church and state because of what it's doing and in their context is they're coming out of England where, Hey, there's, even though it's Protestant primarily at the time, you know, the founding of the country, there's still, um, um, uh, this idea that the king is is the pope of the church in a sense, right? 
And so that separation has happened in the United States, which, which kind of breaks that what you just said, you like the church cannot have power over the country. Right. Yeah. One thing I, I heard explained really, uh, really well from a politician theologian um, is that when the government does have the power over religion, it, in the beginning, you might agree with them and be glad because they're supporting your religion. They support maybe even 100% consistently what you believe. But over time, they have the power to still mandate religion. Their beliefs change. Um, yeah. and, and now you are persecuted or um, illegal to, to practice what you believe. Yeah. And I, I, you know, that kind of religious freedom was a new ideal, I think, that came after the time of the Reformation. Um, and it was it was really new. And it also progressed. It wasn't like, oh, you know, state mandated religion one day and f- religious freedom the next. It was like, OK, oh, you yeah. know, Jews, Jews and Muslims and Christians can practice unless you're Roman Catholic. That was like the big thing. Yeah. Roman Catholics can't practice, but, and yeah. then, you know, just generally grow over time. Yep, it does. And then you see that in England too, right? That's why you have, you know, the uprising, the English Revolution, right? You have Oliver Oliver Cromwell, a lot of those who joined his cause were fighting for religious freedom in a country where everyone had to be like Anglican, you know? Very interesting guy, for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's back up a little bit here. And why does it matter to learn about early church history? Like, so if you're a Protestant and you're listening, or if you're just, you know, regular dude, and you're like, hey, I'm curious, why study early church history? One, as I already said, uh, the Reformation just didn't happen out of nowhere. There's a lot that led up to it. As, as uh, one professor told me when I was in seminary, there was a lot of boiling pots. You know, you had something boiling over in uh, over in uh, England. You know, the thing boiling in Italy. You know, the thing going on in France, right? And there's just there's these, there's these small revolutions, you know, taking place, and it all kind of tops kind of came off at the same time. So there's a lot that led up to um, the Reformation. I think the other thing is we're all connected to a greater tradition. Like we're Christians, you and I, we, we are followers of Jesus Christ. And I think it's a really healthy to acknowledge that there are, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us and who have died for the faith, who have died to stand upon um, their, their biblical convictions that Jesus Christ is the savior, you know? And so uh, we have, yeah. I think, I think it's healthy to, to see that as Christians, you know what I'm saying? There, there are hundreds of people, just to take another example from the Reformation era, hundreds of people who died as martyrs simply because they refused to um, accept the doctrine of Catholic transubstantiation. Um, they died yeah. simply on the grounds of Christ's body is not physically present in the communion bread and wine. And yeah. because it has gospel implications, you know, why did they die for that? For good reason. And you see Christians who are willing to they believed doctrine matters and they were willing to put their lives and their livelihoods on the line for it all the way from the early church where, you know, almost all of the apostles gave their life for the faith until, until, until now where Christians are still being killed every day across the globe. Yeah. And this is really foreign to the American church that um, I I preached a a sermon. um, We did a God government, the gospel series and, you know, you preach your classical texts about government and, you know, about go- where, where the Bible addresses government, Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. But I also preached a, a passage on Daniel 6, where, where uh, it was about Christian descent. Like, when is it okay for a Christian to descend from the governing authority when they tell you you can't worship your God? Well, we see that not only in biblical history, as it were, but all throughout history. You know, it's not just in scriptures and the history that we read about in the scriptures. What do we see that coming out of and birthed out of the church, right? We see persecution right away under Emperor Nero and Diocletian in particular. And we see people who are willing to die for what they believe about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you took a particular issue. You're mentioning transubstantiation. Well, that's a gospel issue. Like, did you, does Jesus die over and over and over again as transubstantiation would hold? Well, no. And so if you say no, yeah. then all of a sudden that context. Moreover, will... Like, does, does taking communion in part the sacrifice of Christ and his and yeah. the grace that comes from that to you. Right. Um, or is that applied through faith? Yeah. I think that, yeah. I mean, anyway. we're taking, we're taking one issue, but I think the major point is that we see a pattern in history. And that's why it's important to study church history because those patterns help inform our present and inform our future. And, and like I said, as American Christians, we have a hard time getting our mind around that kind of persecution that takes place, being persecuted for what you believe about Jesus Christ. But there's going to be a day where the, it's not going to be like this in America. 
I mean, I, I, Amer- I love, I love the constitution. I, I am uh, as patriotic as one could be and still be a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't override my faith and my love for Jesus and the church, but I love, I love America, but it won't last forever. And there'll be a day where, as we've seen in history, Christians in America will be persecuted for their faith one way or another, physically and yeah. other ways. Another, I think another reason you, you wrote this down in our notes, but another reason why yeah. studying church history is important is because there are patterns yeah. that yeah. reoccur. Um, so there's, saying, there's yeah. patterns we can see. One of those, one of those patterns is that it, interestingly, persecution typically leads to a stronger Christianity. Um, a Christianity and power usually led to a weaker Christian biblical. Exactly. And when I say weaker, I mean like orth, with, in regards to orthodoxy, yeah. um, a weaker Christianity. And I, that's one pattern that you'll see now is um, Christianity had a time in America of strength, of power. Um, yeah. And they, the, you know, the blood of the martyrs it. is the seat of the church, as they say. And uh, we see in Acts, we've been going through the book. Was that of Acts. Origin? That was an early church father who said that. Uh, Tertullian. Tertullian yeah. yeah Tertullian. So, you know, we see that throughout Acts, right? We've been going through the book of Acts at Redemption Hill Church uh, located in the Des Moines Metro. Just a quick plug there. And um, as the church is being persecuted, what happens? They disperse and they go to the ends of the earth. And we see God's sovereignty at work in, in being displayed in the persecution of, of Christians, um, of the church. And so I think we can't be put off by persecution. We need to, we just need to back up and say, hey, in light of what we know about the Bible, church history, what is God doing right now? So again, early church history leading up to the Re- Reformation, extremely valuable for Christians to learn. There's a ton there. We're, again, we're just kind of giving the overview, trying to make an apologetic of why it's important. Any other reasons why you think just studying church history would be important, Brooks? Just one more. And it's usually that if you're, if you're wrestling through a topic, um, there is a very high likelihood that people in history have thought through this um, in many different ways. Um, so if you look through church history, you'll see, for instance, you're thinking about the Trinity. People yep. have thought about the Trinity in different times and different cultures in different societies. Um, and just a general wealth of Christian thought on a specific subject can really inform how you think. Um, because a lot of times we're looking at things through our own lenses, our cultural mm-hmm. lens, um, our, our chronological lens of you know what time we're living in. It helps to have other people's opinions to strengthen our own, even in our own time and our own culture. That's but exactly you could also right. branch out and see, you know, be informed in your opinions by people outside of your culture. Um, what did the yeah. people in the early church in, in, in North Africa think about uh, election? How do they yeah. understand predestination? Um, that I think that's generally really helpful. Yeah, and there's nothing new under the sun, as we read in Ecclesiastes, right? That's a very true statement. And uh, there's no new ideas under the sun. Uh, You are not original. (laughs) You know, if a pastor gets up there and says, hey, I got this great idea I want to tell you, and it's truly a biblical uh, principle, it's not original. It's not new. It's likely that he took it from somebody else who took it from somebody else who actually read their Bible. (laughs) Um, And we see that. That's called historical theology, where we see the development of doctrine over over centuries, which kind of leads into different ways to study church history, which I want to quickly talk about. Um, one of those ways is, you know, historical theology. So take, let's go back to transubstantiation, Brooks. Um, that's a particular um, theological issue you brought up. Well, that wasn't, that, that I, the theology of transubstantiation wasn't created out of a vacuum, right? It has a historical precedent. It was developed over time. And usually doctrines are developed over time when there's a pressing need, which we'll get into here when we talk about councils and creeds. Um, same thing with the doctrine of predestination or the uh, justification of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, justification by faith. Those things get developed because um, widely held assumptions begin to get challenged. And so we see theology kind of develop over time. It's called historical theology. And developing as well, I think it's important to know, just doesn't mean it suddenly appeared at a point in history. Right. It means there, there were actually actual developments in the in the explanations of the doctrines and the implications for instance that we talked a lot about transubstantiation but um you have early church fathers who talk about you know the body and blood of christ being present in the elements um did they all did they make the assumptions that the catholic church now does about grace being imparted through them um especially salvific grace no but you know they might look back catholic theologians might look back and say oh they did believe in this 
they do, but not in the way that, that you're intending. This doctrine developed over time right. into something that was unbiblical because of one minor misunderstanding became a now, now a major theological gospel issue. Yeah, like transubstantiation, again, as an example, really got to refined at the Council of Trent. And um, Council of Trent, uh, 16th century, going... The took, most notorious. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Council of Trent, like, it took like... Um, I don't know how many years, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years, or something like that, <laughs> an entire council. So, But one of the issues they addressed was transubstantiation because that was being attacked during the Reformation. And so they're refining what the Catholics were refining what they believe. So historical theology is valuable in terms of trying to understand church history. Uh, some other ways to understand church history is just simply through the biographies of, of thinkers and theologians, right? So we can go back to a person like Origen. What did Origen believe? What was his biography? Where is he from? And then we can move into Ignatius of Antioch. We can get into uh, John Chrysostom. We can get into Augustine and kind of continue to move forward chronologically. And that's a valuable way. I, I enjoy that way because I like reading biographies, right? I don't know about you, but that's me. I, yeah, I really enjoyed reading it. And it, it, they've surprised me greatly Yeah. Um, because they are not perfect. You know, no. it, we sometimes assume, you know, that they're, that people in the early church were a lot more perfect, a lot more willing to dedicate their lives to it. But you see people like Origen and Tertullian who had like really weird beliefs mm -hmm. and were and completely disagreed with each other on many major issues. Yep. Um, and yet we're still very impactful in developing the theology of the church so much so that there were emperors in the Byzantine empire who, you know, ordered all of Origen's books to be burned. Right. <laughs> because right. It's so influential. Yeah. Even Augustine, you know, he was a Manichian in the, before, you know, before he got saved and there was a particular worldview that he came out of and then all of a sudden saved by the grace of the gospel as he sees listening to Ambrose uh, preach in Italy. Like, I think it's in Milan, if I'm mistaken. If I'm, if I'm mistaken, I'll go look it up, but he was listening to Ambrose. That's true, yeah. And so um, I think that's really helpful because then, you know, we don't want, we, we begin to see our own testimony, right? We see what God has done. You know, this is not, while it's new to me, you know, personally, when I, you know, got saved and the grace that continues to flow because of Jesus Christ, but we see what God's always been doing as we read the biographies of these great thinkers. And they're, it's just really helpful. It's just another way to kind of study church history. Um, another way it would be through just kind of a pure historical perspective, chronological. So you have like the apostolic fathers. Think like, you know, Book of Acts. Then we have, we just kind of move on to apostolic fathers. And we have some apologists like Justin Martyrs. We kind of continue to move through chronologically in history. Then we kind of have this church fathers era. And that's just another way to think about, um, I would say if you take a seminary class, perhaps you can give me your thoughts on this, Brooks, but seminary classes generally teach chronologically when they talk about studying church history. Would you say that's true yeah. in your experience? Uh, in my experience, yes, we, we've gone through it chronologically, which has been really helpful for me. Yeah, and that's, and that's a helpful way. I think you miss some things along the way because you just, a lot of it's like dates and times, you know. Yeah. This happened then, so this happened then. The benefits of it are you see the development and the change that happens, the major change that happens over time. Um, what it's not helpful for is understanding how individual issues developed over time. Right. Um, so, you know, you look at the doctrine of the Trinity, and if you're going chronologically, you see like, you know, some of the major councils and major arguments, but you miss a lot of the, a lot of the writings and yeah. um, the important developments that happened over time. And uh, hopefully a good early church history class or any church history class will try to incorporate some of those um, seminal documents, you know, that you read even just portions or, or segments of it. And yeah. that, that's a good so thing. Just, I guess, a plug for Midwestern. Um, mm -hmm. What has been fantastic about my church history class, it's a lot of reading um, and it's pretty, pretty heavy on the work, but um, you're reading a book about church history and kind of going through the textbooks. There are a couple yeah. of them. Um, but you're also every week reading through multiple um, source documents from that period. So, you know, you're reading through all of the documents of the early church, reading through what did Constantine and Charlemagne, what do they actually say about what they were thinking? Yeah. Um, what did Augustine, what did Pelagius actually write? That was one of the most interesting to me is reading a letter that Pelagius wrote. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, just to, to plug, it's been amazing going through all of these actual source documents, reading through George Whitfield's sermons and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I had the same experience at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, where I went, seems like forever ago, 10 years ago now. I had a fantastic early church history uh, teacher, Steve McKinnon, and um, who had a profound impact upon my life. 
but he just he it was it was him more than anyone who just kind of like opened my eyes to the riches of early church history and why we should be studying it um and so part of it was getting to the source materials you know it's not just the dates and the times and the, when the councils took place and that's important because you need markers right you got to fit things in but it's actually reading augustine it's actually reading um cyril of alexandria that was the, you know it's a particular figure that he studied um it's studying for me it was gregory of nyssa when i did my master of theology degree at saint john's like i just I really got into kind of the Cappadocian fathers and then really dug into Gregory of Nyssa in particular. And what did he write? You know, some of, some of what he said is it would not be ex accepted today. He'd be like, heretic, burn him, you know, allegory flying all over the place in terms of inter interpretation, but it's really valuable to look at. Those we, Alexandrians. Yeah, those, well, that brings me to the next thing. It's another way to look at church history is through geography. And, and what's been really popular when it comes to teachers teaching um, uh, church history, they'll pit the Alexandrian fathers against the Antiochian fathers. They have right. a different, different, different interpretations of the Bible. One being more allegorical. That's the claim with the Alexandrians. One being more literal. That's the claim yeah. with the Antiochians. Literalistic. It's yeah. interesting because they were, I don't, there were some who were not, but they were overall, they were pretty um, polarized on those ends. Like, like genuinely the Alexandrians and the Antiochians was, and that was an important distinction in that time that we yeah. don't care about as much now. Yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Just the, how different factions <laughs> exist over in different periods of church history that made an impact, but you don't actually see it. One of my favorite people from that period, from the like whole Antiochian and Alexandrian school mm -hmm. was Clement of Alexandria. He's probably yeah. my favorite early church oh, father. Yeah. I, he was just super level-headed um, super well-written pastoral. I, I really appreciated him. Yeah, no, it's good. You know, it's interesting about studying it that way with, with this distinction, you know, between the Alexandrians and the Antiochians. As evangelical Christians, who would we appeal to right now, right? Pick, if you had to pick one camp, what would you, where would you go? You go to the, you <laughs> where go to would the I, I would go to Antioch. No, I wouldn't go to Antioch. That's the thing. I feel like everyone else would, but I was like, well, that's, with the well, I think you're actually making my point. The Antiochians had to, you know, they strove for an literal interpretation of the Bible. What do our hermeneutics classes teach? A literal interpretation of the Bible. Where did the most prominent um, theological positions come out of in the early church? Kind of second century, third century, fourth century. Came out of Alexandria. Yeah. You know, I mean, Athanasius of Alexandria. I mean, the, he, he was a minority. Because there's something to be said about interpreting the bible according to its the literary nature of each document mm -hmm. um it's something that antioch missed and had major theological implications um yeah. for instance some people accuse tertullian of legalism and i don't want to i'm not calling him a legalist but it's not a very far off accusation yeah yeah no you're right and so again we're just trying to we've been trying to lay out some different ways to study church history final way to, to study church history would be through what we already mentioned creeds and councils right Again, you can kind of get this in the chronological perspective, but you could actually dial in to the most prominent creeds and councils. And that's actually where I kind of want to land, uh, at least in the bulk of our remaining time, because because the creeds and councils really help develop the theology that we preach on every single Sunday. Right. The, the books that we have. Uh, let's just go with like the, the most prominent one. Every, if you say Council of Nicaea, everyone's like, oh, I know Council of Nicaea because that's the most popular one. Right. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. 325. And it, but here's the thing, that council was not developed out of nowhere. There was a controversy that took place, right? And yeah, so we, we with had pretty much all of them, there was a controversy that took place. It, exactly. And so, um, you know, we had, it's when Emperor Constantine finally is kind of on the scene, you know, he has his moments where he sees something, he has his vision, and he gets saved and all that kind of stuff. And then now he's like, okay, no longer is the church going to be persecuted but you're free to worship, um, you know, the God of the Bible. And so now we have the freedom to meet as a council. So that's a huge issue. The issue with, with, um, with uh, the Nicene, um, with the Council of Nicaea in 325 was this battle over the nature of Christ, right? Like, how, who is Jesus? We got the, is he fully God, fully man? What does that mean? How do we put it together? What's the language that we use? Like, language is really important to the early church fathers. It wasn't trying to find the greatest metaphor to describe the Trinity or um, the nature of Christ. It was the words that they used that really mattered. And so we have this battle between Arius, right, on the one hand, and then Athanasius. And at the time, Athanasius was the minority. Like, 
there it was if you would have like if you were if Vegas existed at the time, Brooks, people would be betting on uh, Arius to win over Athanasius, <laughs> and but he won the day because he kept going back to the scriptures. He said, "Look here, look here," and so uh, that was that was the the most important theological debate during that time, uh, three twenty five hey. Council of Nicaea. Go ahead. No, that I think that's great. I was just. Um, in agreement with you. Yeah, and there's other things in play during that, um, like, you know, celebrating Easter, the validity of baptism, you know, things like that. So, but 325 is massive. Um, another big creed is the Council of Constantinople in 381. Again, Arianism is still around, Polinarianism is around, Sabellianism is now around. And so they have to, they have to kind of work through some of those theological debates. Uh, next big council is going to be like Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. Um, dealing with Nestorianism and the Theotokos controversy, right? Remember the Theotokos? Like, yeah. um, you know, is it is it uh, Theotokos or, or or is, you know, God inside of Mary? Is it Jesus inside of Mary? We're talking about the virgin birth. That's mm -hmm. where that debate kind of comes out of. Yeah, I think it's interesting too, because you would also assume that the council settled things but they didn't necessarily. They were continuing arguments about them usually after the councils. And so sometimes you point to councils and be like, oh, the church accepted these as authoritative. They did accept them as authoritative, but people still argued with them and about specifically about words. What was most common was not people saying, oh, the council was wrong. It was saying um, like this specific word shouldn't have been used or uh, because you're talking about the importance of words in, in uh, the councils and, and the arguments of the day. Yep. And in that council uh, where they had to the, talk about Nestorianism and Theotokos, he had Pelagianism, right? Yeah, Pelagius. And so he and Augustine are writing back and forth and debating. And so that was the next big thing um, during that particular time period. Did you study Augustine? Yeah. Have you studied a lot of Augustine yeah. in Midwestern? Good. I believe so. Yeah, we did. Um, I've also read a lot of Augustine on my own. I've read City of God and I have read his book, De Trinitate on the Trinity. Yep. And Confessions, um, another he's big one. Probably my favorite theologian. I started Confessions and never finished it. He's probably my favorite theologian throughout history, though. Um, mm. It's very interesting. And seeing his discussions with Pelagius, um, I think they were both pretty like adamantly against one another. Um, but, you know, sometimes I like I would assume Pelagius is like, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. Pelagius seemed like almost bent out of shape that Augustine was arguing with him, like just angry. And um, this is very interesting, like the whole culture of the times and the culture of the argument um, that people, these are real people really and real arguments that they were having over issues that they cared about deeply. Yeah. Oh, very deeply. And they had implications for what you believe about God and what you believe about how, you know, the, the practice of the Christian life. Right. So these things truly do matter. And yeah, they, they believe deeply. You know, another council I wanted to mention, because as Protestants, again, we love the Reformation. You know, I have my, I have a picture of my five solas kind of hanging in my office here. So I, I love all the solas. There was another big council that took place as a reaction to the Reformation. So we have all these great councils in early church history. There's more we could mention. There's way more. Next big one, though, I There's think multiple. You consider the remonstrance also. Oh yeah, <laughs> reaction, yeah. but not from the Catholics. That's why I'm saying, like, you you could teach several semesters on councils and creeds alone, right? I mean, there's just so much you can dig into, but a big one is going to be the Council of Trent that we've already mentioned in the 16th century. Right. It's big. It's almost a pivotal point that in, for the, for Catholics that made the theology even even worse. It was almost like, hey, we disagree with these things. These are big issues. And they're mm -hmm. like, well, we're going to double down on those issues. And and instead of, you know, having a somewhat orthodox view of them, we're just going to go full out and against what we, what yeah. you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're basically, you know, the reformers come around. They're like, no, we believe that uh, the final authority and only authority is found in Holy Scripture. So authority is not found in the Pope. It is not found in the council and creeds, right? We spent all this time talking about council and creeds, but they were saying, you know, they're good, they're valuable, they're right if it squares with scripture, right? And that that was that was the massive point because that was getting after the Pope and that was actually getting after tradition as well. And so the Catholics were like, yeah. eh, the whole you know. church magistrate. Yeah. And so the because Catholics, again, talking about power, they had gained the power 
um, and they continually given themselves more power, both religiously and politically, and yeah. a threat to saying, you know, people have the right to interpret scripture individually, the right to read it individually, mm -hmm. and um, the scripture has a higher authority than the Pope. Um, it, it was an attack on the power of the Catholic Church. Yeah, absolutely. A direct attack. And, um, you know, the Catholics were like, no. And so they made several statements on the Holy Scriptures. They made several statements on original sin, right? That was another big one. One of the things that came out of the Reformation, um, it's not, it wasn't new to the Reformation, but it was but it was like reaffirmed that the Catholics have gone away from this idea of total depravity, right? What is the nature of, of you and I right now as a sinner? Are we totally depraved because of our first parents? Or is there something else? How do you define that? What is our nature, right? And so there was a, a splitting there. Go ahead. looks like you're going to say something. You know what, I'm just going to mention, um, after the Reformation, there were a group of Catholics who held to somewhat reformed soteriology called the Jensenists. Yeah. I think they were called the Jensenists. Um, very interesting to me. Yeah, why um, that? Clearly, it didn't last, but um, people in the Catholic Church, you know, the Catholic Church itself values church history. They value the councils and creeds, um, and people would, that would consider themselves of the Augustinian tradition like the Jensenists did, mm -hmm. um, would look back on Augustine and say, we're actually not following tradition. The problem is right. that tradition in the Catholic Church is contradictory. You know, it doesn't always right. agree with itself, but. Yeah. Um, another big doctrine, uh, Brooks, and um, this was this is one of Luther's big deals was justification by faith. You know, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be made right in front of a holy and just God? And we've touched on this already a little bit. Is it our works? Is this like a works-based salvation? Are we justified that way? Or is there another means? And so this is the famous passage yeah. from Romans, Romans 1 that Luther goes to. Uh, go ahead. No, what's the passage? Go ahead. No, I thought you were going to say something. I'm sorry, man. Um, so um, all I was going to say on that is um, that's a huge doctrinal issue um, that the Reformation takes up. Now, again, it wasn't like brand new. Augustine uh, talks about justification as well. So again, they're going oh, back gosh. to the original text. Yeah. So we have I was I was actually going to add, I just thought you were going to read the passage. Um, I was actually going to add it's justification by faith mm -hmm. as opposed to where does the the salvific grace of God come from? Mm -hmm. um, does it come through your faith, through your believing, or does it come through penance? And penance was probably one of the greatest um, issues with justification by faith in the Catholic Church and what ultimately led Martin Luther um, to to nail the 95 theses to the door and start a, a, the reformation yeah. unintentionally. So the issue with penance uh, is that it was being translated out of the Latin. And so the whole idea is that if you would be made right with God, you go do a penance. Well, out of the Greek, the words repentance, <laughs> two very different things. So it turns it, penance is, you know, something that the priest has me do. Repentance is something we do in front of God. And so you, again, you, right. you kind of, you're taking away the authority that exists within the church, right? That with the priest and the Pope or their, whatever else have you. And you make that relationship between the individual and God. I mean, that's, that was a massive change. That was the, I mean, the veil came up when people began to realize I don't need to go right. to the priest to be justified. I go right to Jesus. And it, interesting in the language. Cause you know, the, the Martin Luther's first thesis in the 95 theses is when our Lord Jesus said, repent, he meant that the entire life of a believer should be one of repentance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just the, the idea of repentance is not a bad thing. The idea of penance is. This also gets into why certain, um, it's important to have good scholarship in your translations of the Bible. Um, for instance, you know, writing with a few manuscripts versus the 3,000 plus manuscripts we have available to us, um, reading straight out of the Latin Vulgate, which the Catholic Church protected for so long, um, versus actually going ad fontes back to the texts. Yeah, ad fontes. That's really important. So, um, so you know, some other things. You know, when we say go back to the text, we're going back to the original Greek manuscripts, original Hebrew manuscripts that, and then the early church fathers as well to kind of to kind of bring it back there. That we got the reformers reading the early church fathers who are reading the Greek texts, <laughs> and that's that's just confirming theological positions that uh, Catholics had moved away from and, have, and are, and frankly, are still away from, which is, you know, discouraging. Every, everything from justification, original sin, sacraments, baptism, confirmation, 
that whole process. Um, uh, Mariology, uh, that's, that's a massive issue that I have with the Catholic Church, um, period. <laughs> Any other thoughts on yeah. church history, man? Um, I think just to sum it up, yeah, it's very important to go through and read church history. Um, the most valuable thing to me has been getting books from people throughout church history and reading them. So instead of reading like a history of the local church or the history of the church, I mean, um, which is great. Um, I've mm-hmm. got a number of books I could recommend on that. It's also helpful to just grab a book that was written by Augustine and read through it. Um, yeah. Th- there's also, I think one of the books we have for class is called Documents of the uh, Early Church. It's just got a list of a ton of source documents yeah that's from the valuable. early church you can read there it's it's super valuable to me so you had mentioned augustine being one of your favorites are there, are there other ones that you're you find yourself gravitating towards um who are part of the early church you said clement of alexandria yeah so i think the two that i would respect most from that time would be clement of alexandria and uh and augustine for sure okay that's cool you know i mean i, I would not i i think my least favorite are origin and tertullian like, Why is that? Um, their views were were somewhat um, polarized on and to a, a really bad end. Um, so I think both of them, you know, Tertullian took the end of the um, literalistic interpretation to a point that had really bad implications. I think Origen took the allegorical interpretation to a point that had really bad interpretations. Yeah. And I, I liked seeing how the church brought their views together over time. Yeah. Here's a, here's why I don't hate on origin too much. He was one of the really earlier ones. He, he wrote probably the most, the first systematic theology book. And so he was doing things that nobody had ever thought of before in terms of really wrestling with the text. Now I'm not saying he didn't have his foibles or whatever, you know, certainly did. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to disrespect them. But I, yeah. What I mean is of, of my people that I would consider genuine Christian mm-hmm. early church fathers, um, they're, they're probably the ones that I'm like, like when I'm reading their stuff, I'm a little yeah, wary. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> you know, some of my favorite, you know, so, so Augustine's the goat. So we just get past that. Yeah. We're get, we're past that for sure. Yeah. Augustine's the greatest. Yeah. Yeah. He's a goat. And until you get, <laughs> until you, you know, from a reform perspective, until you get to Calvin, he's a goat, <laughs> you know, um, I, Athanasius for me, uh, I love Athanasius. I think his, um, his view of uh, the nature of Christ was, was pivotal. And so he became a, yeah, absolutely. a father for me, a church father, where I just really just loved his reading on the incarnation. Uh, some other ones that would, that I would probably throw in that category would, um, would be Justin Martyr. He, he's an apologist, right? Defending the faith. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so he would be a big one, at least, in, you know, kind of in that he's still living in that first century going into the second century. So a lot of the debate was still going on there. And then uh, I'm trying to think of another one. Eusebius. Eusebius, Eusebius you mean? Yeah. I never yeah. say his name correctly. Eusebius. Yeah, that's all right. And then, of course, you know, the Cappadocian fathers to me, like they, they love their allegory, especially Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, mm-hmm. But they said they did some good work, man. And they did some did good you work. Say doc- uh, did you say Gregory of Nyssa is who Dr. McKinnon was doing his work on? No, he did Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril of Alexandria. Yeah, gotcha. yeah I did Gregory of Nyssa. I did a thesis on him. And I just enjoyed, you know, reading him, even if I didn't agree with them, it was really helpful just to understand how they were, how many people during that time were thinking about interp- interpreting the Bible. I was, I specifically yeah. looked at interpreting One of my, principles. Some of my favorites, not, they're not during this time. They're, they're about a thousand years after, but um, I really enjoyed reading Thomas Aquinas. Oh yeah. Um, so we're getting into uh, middle ages, Renaissance. Well, not before, right. I guess people call it middle it ages. Was, it, was a, really term, very, right? it was the very start of the Renaissance. Um, you know, when, when scholasticism became a thing and, um, I think learning moved away from one place and into another, and you had a whole wealth of people trying to think logically through their faith and a, a need for defending the faith. And people like Thomas Aquinas were, uh, were really, I think, instrumental in starting the, the, um, a whole practice of apologetics. So I want to end with two questions, um, I'm going to circle back to, um, you know, our first question, which is why study early church history. I'm going to ask you to answer that, uh, Brooks. And then I want to end by, um, you know, just addressing um, some resources. Where where would one go to begin to study church history? Let's say you're a novice. You 
you know, you're a Christian, you go to church, church history is foreign. How do you, how do you even begin? So let's circle back to the original question. Um, again, just reinforce why, why does it matter to study um, church history, history in general, of course, but in particular, as from a Christian perspective, church history? I think major reason is because the conversations that go on now did not start with your favorite theologian, you know, John Piper, R.C. Sproul. They didn't start when you started reading your Bible. They yeah. started 2,000 years ago and, and then even further back, you know, five, 6,000 years ago. Um, as the church has grown over time, we have expressed our understanding of certain doctrines that's important to have as a foundation for where we are now. Because you, you think of like building a house, um, you, st- you lay the foundation first, you start building like the bottom layer of the house, you go up. We're currently at near the top of the house, um, yeah. but it's important to understand what the foundation was. You know, some of the foundational conversations about, about the Trinity, about original Christian doctrine, um, especially in the early church, I think about uh, Christian life and Christian practice are the foundation for the conversations we're having now. And you can go very awry if you're not having, if you don't have the information for those things but also just as an encouragement to read people's lives yeah. because there are people just like us that are talking about these things and working through them um, and to see how genuinely, genuinely, genuinely how they lived their lives in service to Christ, what they were thinking at the time, um, I think is very helpful. Yeah, it is. It's encouraging to read, you know, the church fathers, even if it's just a biography or even their, their primary sources, what they actually wrote. I think it's, I think it's a, a great encouragement to do that. So I think that's good, man. Um, and then re- go lastly, yeah. some resources to recommend. Yeah. Um, there is a book called Church History in Plain Language. It isn't one of my textbooks. No, it's not by Gonzalez. It's by a man whose name is escaping me at the moment. Let me look at it. Maybe it. been Shelley. Bruce Shelley. Yeah, yeah it's Bruce okay. Shelley. Yep. Um, so those aren't, it's not my textbook, but it's been one of my biggest go-tos when writing papers and trying to learn more through things. Yeah. Um, it's probably the easiest for me to understand. Um, I, you know, my, and then again, the um, documents of the Christian church, um, Mm -hmm. I think it's by Henry Bettinson is really, it's just, I mean, it's just a collection of church documents. It is so fantastic. It's in chronological order, go through and see what the early church fathers, what people were thinking at the time. There's even documents of people in the state who are persecuting Christians and why they were, what did they think about Christianity to understand history better? It is so important. I, those are my two biggest recommendations, I think. Um, that, and then I would say also go back and read Confessions by Augustine, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or City of God, <laughs> everything yeah, by God. Augustine. <laughs> City of God is is my favorite, but I, I yeah. have noticed that people generally tend to talk up Confessions more. So okay. I just... yeah. um, another another uh, historian that, that is worth reading, he's um, well known in these circles, it's Mark Knoll. Um, he, when I was in Bible school, um, he wrote a small book on church history, just basically, I think it was like five major moments in church history. Now it doesn't give you everything, but he really dials in to these specific moments. And if you're just starting from nowhere, just start getting your mind around just some ma- major, t- you know, flat, you know, you, you put a flag in the sand and it's like a major deal. Like we got to remember this, you know, he kind of does that. You need to remember this, you need to remember this, you need to remember this, you need to remember this. These are important. So Mark Knoll yeah. has done a ton uh, of books on church history. He's a church um, historian. So I would throw that name out there as well. And then, you know, you, Gonzalez and Shelley, uh, they get used in a lot of evangelical seminaries as well. There's a ton of people out there, frankly. But to your point earlier, primary sources are important as well. If you can get your hold, get a hold of primary sources, that's going to help primary you. Primary sources have been the most helpful and humanizing of them. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for like a textbook going through church history, Um, there's a book, I mean, there's two books just called Church History, Volume Mm -hmm. 1 and Volume 2. First is by Everett Ferguson, the second is by John Woodbridge. Those are, those are the actual textbooks for my course, and they've been really helpful, especially the one by Everett Ferguson. Yeah. Well, here's one, one thing I would, I would say in closing, um, we've talked about church history, we've talked about the Reformation, we're still living church history as well, right? We're now a part of this great tradition that exists. And so as, as, as ones who are uh, a part of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, we have the great privilege to continue what great men have done before us, what great men and women have done before us. And so it, it you do know, you want to reform? Oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Well, well, no, it's, it's the reformation principle, right? We're reform and always reforming. Right. 
um, we standing upon God's word. And so um, we, we're, we're a part of that. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's sobering. Um, you know, what's, what's heaven going to be like, Brooks, when all is said and done and uh, Jesus comes back to redeem his bride, you know, we'll be with Augustine. That's crazy to think about. <laughs> so. That is awesome. Yeah. And Calvin and Luther and, you know, the whole lot. And us, us little peons will be maybe like. Even some that you don't, maybe some that you don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it for now, man. I know we had to cut this one just a touch short. We're doing this during uh, our lunch hour. So Brooks, I just want to say thanks for taking time in just the middle of your work day to, to do this podcast with me. Uh, it's good to, it's good to do this together again, man. Yeah, absolutely. I missed it a lot. I'll do it again anytime you want, honestly. Yeah. Uh, likewise, if you ever want me on your podcast, I'll actually sign up on your calendarly that you always send me that I never sign oh, up for. <laughs> <laughs> but a horrible friend well that's it for now um god bless you all and uh thanks thanks for taking interest hey hey brooks logan logan gets on on me for this i don't um do a good enough job of of putting myself out there what do i need to do what, what do people need to do uh, to, uh to, in order to uh push forward this podcast you're the marketing guy i think the biggest thing is if you enjoy this podcast um go like leave a rating and write your thoughts on it really helps the algorithm when people are looking for new podcasts about certain topics. Yeah. Um, but Sean, personally, something you need to do is make sure that your titles are written well and are things people are looking for I'm Horrible. Um, because your biggest growth is going to come from people who are wanting to listen about a certain topic or a certain type of podcast you need a rather ghost than people who are. <laughs> I need a ghostwriter. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> well do all those things. Even if you didn't like it, give it five stars. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. Give it five stars and then and then send us a personal message and say why you didn't like it, and we'll tell, we'll be willing to tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> Super humble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks again, everyone, for listening. So until next time, God bless and peace out. This is Cornfield Theology. Bye.